Consider the visitation story in the gospel we call Luke. Over the centuries, brilliant artists have interpreted it on canvas and stone. But how do 21st century American readers hear and interpret this story? It would be somewhat humorous were a contemporary United States reader to imagine Mary getting into her pickup truck, traveling over the interstate, and doing lunch with Elizabeth. Jokes aside, what should we imagine when reading this ancient story? Surely it should be that scenario that Mediterranean culture suggests. For the first reading of all scripture and the Gospels is Mediterranean culture. In this ancient Mediterranean story, Mary seems to travel on a four-day journey alone. Folks, women in the ancient Middle East and circa Mediterranean world could never do anything alone. Either they were constantly inside a cluster of women and children, or always under the watchful eye of some significant related male family member, their father, brother, or husband. Consider Mary, no older than 14 years, betrothed but not yet living with her husband, going about the Middle East alone, unchaperoned, unaccompanied, unencompassed. How vulnerable would she be to charges of shameful intentions and conduct? And she is pregnant, and there she goes on her solo journey. Even if a village male were to do this kind of traveling alone, that would earn him being labeled a social deviant. Can you imagine what a pregnant teenage girl in this ancient culture doing this would be called? Would anyone from this cultural world witnessing her do this have any doubt in their mind about her pregnancy afterward? To them it would be obvious how she got pregnant. And I'm not talking angels and God, folks. Americans belonging to the only culture seemingly crippled from distinguishing truth from facts are obsessed with facticity and historicity. Did this visitation story really happen? Whatever the case, in the story at least, perhaps Mary joined a caravan. Even for ancient men, solitary travel was not safe. But Luke doesn't mention that Mary joined a caravan. Is there a plausible cultural explanation for Mary having a solo journey? Maybe. 21st century Western people have sophisticated knowledge unknown to ancients like Luke and his audience. It becomes extremely difficult for us to suspend this scientific knowledge in order to understand simpler human explanations for pregnancy found in ancient scripture. We forget that only 200 years ago, we didn't know about the facts of reproduction and childbearing. So, biblical authors and characters held a much simpler view of life than we do. The ancients believed that the male deposited an homunculus, that is, a miniature, fully formed human being, into the female. The male provided a seed, the woman was the field. According to this worldview, conception difficulties are entirely the fault of the field and not the seed. Ever since human beings have been around, pregnant women have experienced movement of the child in the womb. Recall the mythic story of Genesis chapter 25. Rebecca felt movement and perhaps even suspected that she was bearing twins. That movement got interpreted as a struggle between the children, symbolizing the eventual struggle of two nations both children represented. In the visitation story, Elizabeth interprets the movement of her child in her womb as a leap prompted by joy at hearing Mary's greeting. When Elizabeth informs her kinswoman about this, Mary may well have been confirmed in another growing conviction about her own fetus. Just as the angel announced, her yet unborn child is holy. What did the author we call Luke mean by holy? The words holy and holiness bear at least 2,000 years of theological freight. So let's peel that later evolved and accrued meaning back so as to honestly understand what Luke meant in his context. Doing that, we discover that holiness for Luke is a quality that wards off or protects against evil and demons. 
In modern technical jargon, the unborn child's holiness is an apotropaic power, that is, a force stronger than evil and evil spirits. In this story, Mary could easily conclude that it is safe for her to travel alone because she would be protected by her child's special power. Just as Tobit was protected by the disguised angel Raphael on his journey abroad. Unwise was the ancient traveler who made their way through the wilds and roads out far from home. For in dark corners, greedy eyes glitter, claws curl, teeth click. But bearing a holy fetus with apotropaic powers, what was there to fear? Contemporary cultural descendants of our ancestors in the faith in the Middle East rely heavily on talismans and similar charms, often blue in color, to protect them from evil and evil spirits. Later Mediterranean believers associated Mary with the color blue. Interesting, no? In 1964, the Pontifical Biblical Commission noted that the evangelists selected certain things out of the many which had been handed on. Some they synthesized, and some they explained with an eye to the situation of the churches. So this passage in Luke is considered something he developed as a literary artist, inventing creatively and writing theologically. He's not a journalist, folks. He's not a historian. That's not what Luke Acts is. And so the visitation story does not originate, does not come from the memoirs of Mary, the historical peasant girl. Think about this. Wouldn't Mary have been a very unfeeling kinswoman to carelessly leave Elizabeth, as she does in verse 56, at the moment of Elizabeth's greatest need, childbirth? Luke is surely aware of the cultural inconsistencies and improbabilities of his visitation story. So too were his ancient original readers. But unlike us 21st century Western Bible readers, Luke's original audience easily recognized Luke's intention. The author we call Luke wanted to explain a dimension of the origins of John the Baptizer and Jesus for his readers. No, historically speaking, John and Jesus were not biologically related. They weren't cousins, they weren't kin. Luke made that up. But he brings together the two mothers-to-be to show how both recognize and praise the God of Israel, who is actively involved in their mundane, humdrum lives. That's a profound truth, folks, even if the story details are not factual. We Americans and other Western peoples are notorious for our weak knowledge of history, especially of anything that happened prior to our date of birth. So it is strange indeed when American believers try to pursue the literal facticity of biblical stories such as this, which originally served an entirely different purpose. This story wasn't written to give people facts about what happened. We can only admire the magnificent talent and inspiration of Luke the Evangelist, Luke the Spinmeister, who has made his theological point emphatically, if imaginatively graphic. God does indeed work in strange and mysterious ways, and inspiration must be a messy business.